Okay. All right. I think it's it is time. Let's uh let's get this party started. Welcome everyone um, to our Forest Her webinar for uh, July 2023. And uh, my name is Fallon Owens. I am the Extension Wildlife Biologist with the Wildlife Resources Commission, and I will be your moderator today. Um, today's webinar is all about pollinators um, as part of a, a series about pollinators. And uh, we're gonna focus mostly about um, sort of the relevant topics around pollinators during the, the summer. So uh, it should be a fun time and hopefully everybody will learn uh, something really interesting about these awesome insects uh, that we have and uh, of, of a variety of sorts. So um, just, just kind of to put this particular webinar in context, we've got three webinars for 2023 and we're kind of divvying them out based on season. So we started out with a springtime introduction to pollinators, what they are, um, and what's what's really relevant during the springtime. This is going to focus on more summertime issues. And then stay tuned. In the fall, we're going to talk about um, managing your land and sort of preparing it in the fall to help create a better environment and habitat for pollinators, sort of in that autumn time frame. So here we go into the summer edition. And there you go. There's the uh, summary of the three webinars. Um, so today's our summer edition, and then uh, mark your calendars for October 26th when we'll have that fall version of our All About Pollinator series. A little bit of Zoom housekeeping. I'm going to turn it over very briefly to our wonderful Zoom expert, uh, Bob Barden, and he'll talk about how this is going to operate technically. All right, everybody. Uh, welcome to today's webinar. Uh, we do ask that you please remember to keep your mic on mute. Uh, that way everybody can uh, hear the presentation. If you have, uh, if you want to make comments or having technology type issues or something and need to get a hold of us, uh, you can add that in the chat box. Pretty simple to do. It's just like texting on a phone or something like that. There at the bottom of the chat box, you can type in your message and and hit the send and we'll be able to see it. We are taking questions uh, and we'll be answering those uh, one or two questions right at the end of each participant's presentation, but then we'll follow up with a period at the end of the webinar to go into more questions. So if you have questions today, please click on the Q&A feature and you'll be able to enter those in there so we can track them. Uh, closed captioning is on, so if uh, you can show that on your screen if you need it, uh, you'll be able to see the closed captioning. And then if something really comes up and you need to get our attention, feel free to raise your hand and we will uh, check in with you to see what is needed. And with that, uh, sit back and enjoy. Today's webinar is being recorded, so you'll be able to go back and view it again or share it with a friend or a colleague or family member. Valen? Sure, and, and I'll add to that. Because all of these webinars were recorded, if you're really biting at the bit after today's webinar to see what you missed in the uh, springtime introduction of pollinators, uh, the, the webinar that we had um, back in the springtime, you can go to foresthernc.org and actually view that webinar later. So uh, spread the word and get informed. Um, so going into what we have for you today, uh, our agenda is to, we've got some, some wonderful presentations from some excellent um, sort of subject matter experts about pollinators. Um, we're going to lead off with uh, a really a special guest, uh, Cass Urban Mead, who is with the Xerxes Society. And the Xerxes Society is one of the best, most influential organizations in terms of pollinator science and conservation that we that we have in the country and and I'm sure Cass will correct me if um, if I've misrepresented the Xerxes Society but they're really a, a fantastic organization and uh, we're really excited to hear what she have to has to say today about pollinators in the forest um, then we're going to uh, after that after a five minute Q and A we're going to talk about longleaf pine forest habitats prescribed fire and how that impacts pollinators that's going to be excellent with um, Gabriella Garrison who's with the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission and then we're going to have a special guest who's one of our forest hers a landowner who has been managing her property um, and she's going to talk about her journey of managing that land for pollinators so 
We've got um, some great presentations and also the Q&A where you guys will get a chance to ask questions um, of our presenters and each other. So uh, stay tuned. And with that, um, let me turn it over to Cass Urban Mead and uh, let's, let's learn about pollinators in the forest. All right, thank you so much for that introduction. And it is just so exciting to be here. Um, with all of you today, I'm going to see if I can share my screen here. Did that work out okay? All right. Yes, looks great. Cool. Um, sweet. And I am setting my timer because I can sometimes get too excited and get chatty. Um, but I do want to thank you all so much for having me. It's really an honor to be here. And um, I am based in the Mid-Atlantic now and have done the most um, of my work and life in the Northeast. So this is going to be kind of a bigger overview of Northern, Northeastern biased introduction. Um, and then we'll we'll kind of hand it off, um, Gabrielle and Lee, to, to really go into the next um, the Longleaf and other, other Southeastern ecosystems. So I hope you'll bear with me with that. All right, I'm going to just dive in. My name is Cass Urban Mead, and I'm a pollinator conservation specialist I'm based in the Mid-Atlantic. As I said, I live in the greater Philadelphia area and work in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and New York most often. I'm also a partner biologist um, with the Natural Resource Conservation Service. Um, and, okay, there we go. Um, as you just heard, the Xerces Society, just for a super quick introduction, we're motivated by the knowledge that the health of our insects, you know, only a very tiny percentage of the insect species that we have actually ever do anything pesky or pesty, right? Although we notice them, certainly. But the vast majority of our insects are just absolutely crucial for our survival and thriving world. Nutrient cycling and decomposition, predators and parasitoids services and agricultural systems. They're the base of the food chain after plants in, you know, many, many settings. Um, and then, of course, as a member of Xerces pollinator team, I think a lot about how much of our food is dependent on the pollination services provided by these beloved insects. Um, and the Xerces Society tackles the conservation of invertebrates, so insects, but also mussels and spiders and um, all sorts of other guys without a backbone who we love um, from many different angles. Um, but I am on the pollinator team and really encourage you to, to look into all of our initiatives to include um, community science, endangered species advocacy, um, thinking of carefully about pesticide use and regulations, um, certification programs for cities and campuses, et cetera. We are a member supported organization. So just in case any of you out there are already members, want to thank you um, and welcome you to join us um, if you um, like what you hear today. So the topic of today's um, brief intro um, has a question mark at the end because right, we usually don't think about pollinators in the woods. So I was super excited when I got this introduction to talk about pollinators in the woods. Um, and I thought it's, I know you already had a really wonderful intro um, in March, um, but I thought I'd start with a review or an overview into bee diversity, um, the biology of these amazing wild insects that we that um, provide so many amazing pollination services, and then kind of start thinking about the unexpected ways that they might use woody and forested habitats in addition to meadows and gardens. Um, and we'll tie it all together briefly at the end with a thinking about forest health and pollinators. Um, all right, go. All right, so number one, intro. Um, and I've already revealed my bee my wild bee bias, but I did just want to highlight that, um, of course, bees are not the only pollinators. Um, so um, plants um, can be pollinated by moths, by hoverflies, who are actually often the second most effective after bees, by hummingbirds, beetles, um, ants, and, and many other organisms. Um, but bees are the most effective and efficient at transferring pollen from one plant to another in order to allow the seed or um, fruit to set. 
And when we're talking about bees, the bee that I first fell in love with, the bee that I think most of us are most familiar with that we learn about first in school is the honeybee. And the European honeybee um, is actually did not first evolve on this continent, but came with the colonists in the 1600s um, and is really a wonderful bee as an agricultural project, right? We love honey. We, um, when we don't have habitat for our native bees, who I'll introduce in a second, the European honeybee can be moved around in boxes, right? And so it's actually really helpful if our agricultural settings don't have enough habitat to support wild bees. Um, but we are increasingly learning that at very high densities and when there's high disease pressure, honeybees can actually outcompete with and spread diseases to our wild pollinators. And so that just means we need to be having a complicated and important conversation about how we manage honeybees responsibly. Um, and we have some new resources out about that from Xerces, including a new fact sheet, um, and this really great webinar by my colleague Rich Hatfield called We Need to Talk About Honeybees. And so if I'm not talking only about honeybees today, which I'm mostly going to talk about wild bees, then who are these wild bees? And my favorite way to define a wild or native bee is the fuzzy vegetarian cousin of a wasp, um, which sounds really funny, but basically millions and millions of years ago, wasps a couple of them where, you know, they chase after other insects and spiders and they bring them back to their nest and lay an egg on them and that egg hatches and eats that other insect um, while, the, while it develops. Um, and then they were muddling around in these flowers trying to catch other insects as one of the places they were hunting and realized, whoa, there is so much protein, so many lipids, so many micronutrients in this pollen and nectar in these flowers. And so then all these different types of bees developed who used different types of pollen and different types of nectar from lots of different flowers. Um, and so they also over time developed special fuzzy branched hairs on their bodies that allow them to most effectively gather this pollen and bring it back to their nests on which to rear their young. Um, and so that's that's the their cousins of wasps who feed their babies on pollen, and that's what a bee is. And over time, as these, you know, now bees, these wasp cousins were developing using all different types of flowers, they develop different body sizes, they were active at different types of times of year, they have different types of nest behavior, some of them live with lots of other insects, and some of them are solitary, where only a single female is in charge of a nest. Um, and so because of this, they're active at all different times and use different flowers. And so the most important thing that I think of when I think about conservation of all these bees is to remember that it's a year long process, including protecting nesting habitat all winter in order to do this conservation work. Um, and that's because we have, if you see at the bottom here, over 4,000 species of bees in the US and over 5,000 in North America. There's actually over 20,000 species in the world. Um, and, and in the US, honeybees are only one species, right? Even though there are many individual bees. All right, next, let's see, there we go. And so when we're when we're thinking about them free living in our environment, um, there's kind of lots of different ways to break up the different nesting habitats of these hundreds and hundreds of species. But the three major categories are bees like bumblebees who like abandoned rodent burrows, they like, um, protected areas in shrubs or rock or stone piles under wood piles where they can make a little protected cavity to build a little nest. There's also lots and lots of our solitary bees who each one will make a single hole in the ground and deep underground be making chambers where each chamber will rear one baby bee. She'll fill it with pollen and lay an egg on it. And so this can look like lots of different holes, but each one is actually just kind of like a one bedroom apartment for a single female with her own nest in there. Um, they just, they all realize that this was good soil habitat there. And then another major category, this is about 30% of our bees, nest in wood or stems or other cavities, often in woody material. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. And when we're thinking about solitary bee biology, unlike honeybees and bumblebees who are active all year long, most of our solitary bees have very short adult life bands when we actually see them on flowers. And the rest of the time they'll be in their nest. And because the vast majority of our bees nest in the soil, I put an example here of an underground nesting bee who's active in the springtime. 
Um, and so here's an example of a pupae waiting until the right temperature um, and moisture cues tell them that it's springtime. The males usually emerge a few weeks early, then they'll mate with the females. The females will continue to, they'll start a new nest. And so that's the time of year when you see the adults out visiting the flowers, going back and forth, dropping off pollen in their nest till they've made enough pollen to rear a single baby bee. They lay an egg on it. They close up that little chamber and they won't see that baby ever. That baby will overwinter and then emerge the next spring. A female makes as many of those as she can and then she dies. And you say, of course, but Cass, there's not only bees active in April, right? This is an example of a spring flying bee. There would be others who have a very similar cycle all throughout the growing season. And then bees like bumblebees, of course, their arc would go the whole year long. And so that gives us our full diverse community of bees and reinforces this management implication of remembering that pollinator conservation for wild bees retakes the whole season, including the winter, because they're often overwintering somewhere in order to come out the next year. Okay, so that's a really brief overview of our bees, right, and why we love them. But we want to talk about the woods today. So... Um, jumping right in, you know, when people first started really worrying about honeybees and turning to say, oh, wow, let's think more about our wild species who can help us, the first place that research really looked was in agriculture. And so the first clue that we got that the forest might be important for bees started in crop field studies, where people found interesting things like in crop fields that had more forest and natural habitat nearby, you would find more bees in that field. That's this graph here, more natural habitat correlated with more bees. Then even there were studies looking often in apple orchards and other spring blooming crops who would find that even at the scale of a single orchard, the closer you went down a row to a field, to the forest, sorry, um, you would find more and more species of native bees. Um, which was really amazing because it's often hard in ecology to find patterns like that. So that was a very strong and striking result. There were some studies, particularly in apple and strawberry and some other really beloved spring, flu spring blooming flowers, um, that forests and hedgerows are associated with higher fruit quality. Um, and that having, of course, this natural habitat on the landscape can buffer the negative effects of pesticides, which can be both absolute mortality as well as things like disorientation, lower brood production, changes in sex ratios, and lots of non-lethal effects that can long-term affect the population health of a pollinator community. And so... Um, looking more globally, people have found this pattern not just in the northeastern U.S., where, of course, I'm biased to have spent the most time thinking about, but around the world in lots of different crops. And so because I told you, right, a bee is going back and forth to her nest all day, visiting flowers, collecting pollen, dropping that pollen back off in order to make an, a, a provision for a baby bee. We know that they're they're kind of bound into a, a smaller region, right? They can't just keep moving forever farther and farther across the landscape. They have to go home every time after they visit a flower. Um, and so if we see that there's more bees near forests, we think, well, there must be something about some stage of their life cycle or their nesting that makes that habitat important for them. And the default with bees, of course, is that we see them in our gardens, we see them in our meadows. That's so true, right? That's absolutely right. We know bees use herbaceous and shrubby resources. So I just want to, you know, put that right off. We're gonna, we're gonna absolutely always know that meadows and gardens and late season flowers, um, like you know, our goldenrod meadows are important for bees. Um, but is there more to the story if we also need to look in the woods? So just highlighting, you know, these kind of classic original stories of this is where bees are in the woods is wherever we can kind of cut down trees and make sun or do any sort of management that increases sun. And I think especially in the southeast, um, that's going to be true a lot of the time, but I'm, I'm talking more about deciduous hardwood forests right now. Um, but kind of the default has been edges and gaps are sunnier, that's where the flowers are, and so people have kind of historically thought the place we do bee management is going to be edges, it's going to be log landings, it's going to be, um, a, you know, in, in a clearing, but... Um, um, and that's absolutely true. And usually the patterns that those follow is that there's an immediate flush of flowers um, right after um, right after the sun is able to hit an area that may previously have been very shady and then that that declines over time. Um, but we think there may be more to the more to the story, right? Sorry, I didn't mean to toggle quite so quickly there. Um, 
And um, the reason for this is that we know that our forests are the dominant land cover, both now and pre-colonially across the East Coast, right? And every forest has different historical um, indigenous management, different historical blowdown and fire and disturbance regimes. But forests have always been a part of the story and a dominant part of the story. And so it makes sense that there would be some sort of relationship with certain parts of bees' life cycles that do include mature forest in addition to open areas. Areas. And indeed, a really interesting study pretty recently um, out of northern New Jersey, which is deciduous hardwood forest, um, is that up to at least a third of our fauna in the Northeast relies almost entirely on mature forest. And these are primarily spring flying bees who are active in the spring, whereas another third of the bees relied on forest for part of their lives. Um, and they called these bees our forest associated bees. So what do some of these relationships with the woods look like? We want to talk about first spring ephemerals um, and the ways that bees use flowering plants in those early weeks of spring. Um, I think you talked about this some in March. We'll talk about nesting habitats, which is important all year long. And then we'll talk about resources offered by the forest canopy. Um, and so when we're thinking about spring ephemerals, this really important stage of a healthy, mature forest, these are the flowers that bloom in the early, early spring when sun is still reaching through. Many of our canopy trees have not yet leafed out and sun is still hitting the forest floor. They're called ephemerals because they're only out for a short period of time. And this really important study um, looked at the endangered rusty patched bumblebee, one of our, our, our only federally listed bumblebee, and they looked at the period of time when queens were active in the spring and found that that was the time of year that the forest plant, that the plants that those bumblebees relied on were blooming in the forest. Um, and so they actually concluded by looking at historical records and availability of these plants over um, a long period of time that there was a decline in the bumblebee forage plants in the forest understories, which was a crucial period when those queens were coming out of hibernation and getting ready to found their nests. So this is a critical life stage when the bumblebee queens were coming out, getting ready to start their colony. And then if you look, you know, farther across on time in this graph, the worker bumblebees are active later, the males are out later, next year's queens are out later, and they do use grassland and wetland and other plants. But during this period when the colony is just getting started, that's when forest plants were so important. Um, and so they suggest that one of the major drivers of um, decline in this endangered bumblebee may be a decline in forest health and loss of um, forest understory spring ephemerals. And while we're talking about spring ephemerals, um, this is a super cool group of plants that are only out for this short window, right? And so if you're a solitary bee who's out for just a little period of time, it can make a lot of sense to say, huh, are there some flowers that are blooming just during my activity period? And can I get really good at getting the pollen just from those flowers? And so that results in what these solitary bees do is often specialize on a certain type of flower. So I have a picture here of the um, spring beauty mining bee whose only flower that it'll collect pollen from is the spring beauty claytonia. There's other specialist bees who really love mature forest spring ephemeral flowers. These include the um, crane's bill specialist here, Andrina distans, a solitary mining bee. The trout lily mining bee who only collects pollen from trout lily. Um, and some other bees will come and use the nectar from that pollen. This is actually a kleptoparasite of that bee. There's other specialist bees who are active on violets, on uvularia, and many other common and beloved spring ephemerals. And there's a really wonderful guide based on Jared Fowler's work. Um, this is again, from primarily for the Northeast, but goes through all the known specialist relationships we know of. Um, and so we wanna protect spring ephemerals as one of our implications for this, right? Um, and one major thing in terms of thinking about connections to management and healthy forests is that in many cases, both mature forest regeneration and the health of understory plants, including our spring ephemerals, is really threatened um, by things, including really um, aggressive invasive species that can crowd out our forest floors. And so I just wanted to highlight, you know, there are some really interesting studies that have taken, if you, if you aren't used to thinking about tree ID and these kinds of challenges facing forest health, you may say, oh, okay, we have all these great shrubs, but if they're non-native shrubs, they can, um, 
they can crowd out these other healthy communities. And so in this example, they removed this non-native honeysuckle, and then they found that not only um, did the geranium, the, the native um, geranium come back, but also the pollinator was able to re rejoin that stand um, from other places where it was still living, and seed set and pollination was restored to this spring ephemeral, um, which could have really reinforced the kind of important work that Forest Her is doing, thinking about the active management often needed to help keep all of these ecosystem pieces in balance um, in a forested ecosystem. Another one here, um, this was this was in the Southeast. Um, Mike Ulishan is um, based at University of Georgia. I mean, they followed um, a privet invaded plot for 13 years after the invasive shrub removal. And they found that not only was the next generation of trees, right, the tree regen was restored in the understory, but also that the bee community and the butterfly community came to more closely reflect reference um, communities that had never been invaded, restoring that pollinator community in the understory. All right, so that's what I'm all I'm going to say for spring ephemerals for now, because I have more to say. There's tons to talk about. It's so much fun thinking about these really kind of more hidden interactions. Um, but in terms of nesting, I'm going to go back and start again with bumblebees and then turn to solitary bees. Um, there's increasing evidence that not just the rusty patched bumblebee when she first comes out of hibernation needs spring ephemerals, but also that lots of different species of bumblebees really love to nest in the woods. Um, and a lot of times when I see this happening, it's when the forest is very bare. There's not a lot happening. The trees aren't flowering yet. It can look kind of like, well, surely there's no bees here. And that's when if you look on these well-drained slopes and some sun, you'll find these bumblebees kind of doing their namesake, bumbling around, looking at every little dark spot trying to figure out is this a good place for me to start this year's colony. Um, and here's a really great figure by um, John Mola and colleagues um, who put together all the different ways that different stages of bumblebee life cycles can rely on the forest. Again, the workers will leave the woods often to forage in other places where we often see them, but in many cases they're going back to the woods for nesting, for overwintering, and that may be where their colony is based. Not all bumblebees, but many bumblebees do have these strong reliances. Um, and we have lots more research to do to figure out which species these are and exactly which types of, of soils and, um, and soil conditions and duff layers they prefer. All right, so that, that was my bumblebees for nesting. Now we're going to talk about um, solitary bees again. Um, many of my favorite wood nesting bees who are um, often really abundant in forest studies and often forest associated bees in that North Jersey study I mentioned are um, these shiny wood nesting bees um, like Lasiaglossum curulium and Agachlora pura. And here's an example of one of those shiny green sweat bees and what their tunnels look like when they're using an old rotting log to build these tunnels. They make these little chambers following off of um, the tunnels of an old beetle burrow and they excavate little, little chambers where they'll make their pile of pollen and lay an egg and then those bees will come out next year. So that's super cool. I see these guys all over the place. You start looking for them once you realize they're bees and not flies. I promise you'll find them in your yard. They're very, very cool. Um, you also sometimes find... Um, bees nesting in tip-ups. This was super exciting for me. Again, you can kind of see in the background, not a lot going on in the forest, not what you'd think of as bee habitat. But then I was looking at this soil suspended in the roots of this tip-up. And in just a sec here, there with the sun, you can see these bees kind of zipping forward in the sunlight. Um, and they were nesting really extensively in huge aggregation um, in this wood, maybe some sun, maybe some predator escape. Um, and um, this study, um, which was actually done, um, I think in Florida, found that this tunnel bee who makes these really cool kind of soil tunnel, um, like turrets sticking off of the top of their nest tunnels, really commonly preferred um, what I call tip ups, what they call root plates, right? These these kind of root wads where the where the tree has tipped up. So that's super cool. And then we know the coarse woody debris of the of the trunk can be used for lots of other nesting. All right, um, speaking of course, woody debris and deadwood, um, not only are there wood nesting bees, but of course there's tons of beetles and flies and fungi and infinite other invertebrates and wonderful organisms who really, really need multiple ages of snags standing in downed deadwood at lots of different scales of decomposition in order to complete all their life cycles. Um, and so that I would be remiss not to highlight the importance of that deadwood generally. 
Um, and while we're talking about nesting, the other really crucial thing to highlight is the fact that although, again, we're used to looking at butterflies and thinking, yes, flowers for nectar, yes, that is still true, right? But, cat but butterflies and moths are caterpillars um, for huge parts of their lives. And if you've heard of the work of Doug Tallamy, we know um, that you know a lot of those caterpillars are trying to stay hidden. And so we don't see them unless we're entomologists out looking at our trees. But he found that woody plants, trees and shrubs supported 10 times more butterfly and moth species than herbaceous species. And that in ornamental settings, at least where they worked um, in yards and gardens, native woody plants, many of these again are the same as our forest trees, supported 15 times more native Lepidoptera, that's butterflies and moths, than non-native plants. And when we look at the most important lists of trees for, um, for supporting butterflies and moths, again, many times they're super camouflaged and they're hard to know you're doing this work unless you're thinking about it, where things like oak supporting over 500 species of butterflies and moths, cherry, willow, birch, poplar, maple, hickory, so many familiar and wonderful forest trees. And again, the key here is diversity, not to say kill everything but an oak, right? But to say in order to have our full suite of healthy butterflies that we like to see later in our gardens, later in our meadows, we want to make sure we have these woody plants and other hosts for their, for their larval stages. All right, so there's nesting. And finally, in my last, I think, five minutes I have here, yep, we'll talk about the canopy. So this is just a flash highlight of four cool things that I just would be remiss not to mention. Honeydew is super cool. This is the sugary exudate of scale insects and um, and aphids who poop out the sugary um, liquid after they've sucked the sap from a plant. And in many places, the bees have learned that they can also collect that honeydew in place of nectar, particularly in drought years. So that's a super cool interaction. This often and usually only happens on trees or often on trees. Um, there's two families of our native bees, the aphids and the megachilids, who will collect resins for nest water proofing and for antimicrobial properties. We know that trees in many cases are preferred mating sites. And we know that trees provide not just drift buffers in agricultural settings, which are incredibly important, but they also provide general microclimate moderation and temperature protection. And then my favorite and maybe most exciting use of the canopy is the fact that every blooming tree that a bee is able to gather pollen and nectar from acts like a temporary meadow in the sky. Pretty cool. And all of our insect pollinated trees we know absolutely do this. And maple and willow are some kind of mixed pollination syndromes, but we have found in study after study that maple and willow are just incredibly important powerhouse resources in the spring. I also have a picture of sumac here on the left. And then here in this shelterwood harvest on the right in upstate New York, this was actually a goosefoot maple. And I found these Andrina solitary mining bees, both foraging and mating on those flowers at the same time. Um, and then um, I'm going to skip over some of these things kind of quickly in the interest of time, but we know that there's in tons and tons of insects who used to rely really heavily on chestnut before chestnut blight. Um, if you do get to see a chestnut in bloom, it will be just covered in bees and moths and beetles and spiders and amazing insects. And this specialist bee, Andrina rainey, the lost chestnut bee, we're actually still finding it when people do surveys, so it's somehow lasted on remnant populations. So that's super cool. Um, and the an amount of pollen pro um, produced by a single tree is just astonishing. Um, a single red maple tree um, is one of the ones that people have actually counted. And a single red maple can have over 600 nectar flowers per cubic meter of canopy or over 1,300 um, pollen making flowers. And we're even finding, um, and a single sugar maple tree can have over 100 billion pollen grains, which is totally wild. Um, and so we did some work going up to net in the canopy, looking at bee usage and just can really confirm both from pollen studies and from observation. That's me climbing up a tree with my butterfly net dangling behind me, going to go catch some bees in the tree. Um, that uh, bees really are up there active in the spring when it's really hard to see them from the ground, right? We have such a bias to what we think are important for bees because we are usually stuck on the ground. <laughs> um, 
And then I just wanted to highlight, I, this was super exciting that, you know, there's more and more evidence that bees under certain conditions that we're still figuring out will also collect pollen from wind pollinated trees. This was a pin oak at an orchard where I worked. Um, and this pin oak happened to have its mature pollen on the day I walked by and had flowers near the ground. And there were bees on every single catkin. There's no nectar reward. This tree doesn't need this bee to, in order to make acorns. But the bees said, ooh, there's protein in those pollen grains. I'm going to get it. And there were bees all over this tree. So figuring out when bees really like to use these resources is really important. And we know that it, it has been recorded as early as 1945 here. Um, I'm going to skip over this research here in the interest of time, um, but we do, it's, it's really just driving home, you know, more of these anecdotal evidence that some of these even wind pollinated trees do provide resources, um, that sampling in the canopy is really important, and that there's whole life stages of bees like males and queens who are often active in the woods. So again, forgive me for skipping past that, but I just want to be able to get to my conclusion slides and respect the other presenters. Um, and so a huge part of the non-nesting resources that I've highlighted here, at least in the northeastern forests that I'm most familiar with, the vast majority of activity in mature woods really is going to be in the spring when the canopy and the spring ephemerals are blooming. And this can make it harder, especially for researchers who are often teaching in the spring exactly when this is happening in order to identify it. And I think that's a big part of why so much evidence or so much restoration work has focused primarily on the summer, which is also important. Again, totally, that is still super important. <laughs> and when we're thinking about our community, again, we have these kind of thirds, right? There was, I said, that one third forest associated bees, that one third who need forest for part of their lives and also use open habitat. And then there's absolutely a large group of bees, maybe about another third, who are primarily associated with open habitats. And so if we sample in an open gap in woods and say there's more bees here, at least in the Northeast, there's my timer, it's often because we're getting not just the mature forest associates, but we're also bringing in bees from those open habitats. So we want to think about which management goals and which bees, we think about this for birds all the time, right? Like, are we thinking about birds in closed canopies? Are we thinking about birds who need softwood inclusions? Are we thinking about birds who need shrublands? Same thing with bees. They have these different needs depending on which clade or group or nesting habits they have. Um, and so if you're in a non-forest or a mixed landscape, we recommend keeping at least 20% forest in those mixed landscapes in order to keep your population of forest associated bees. That's what that recommendation is about. All right, so I'm going to wrap up. So our what's going on in the forest, we have nesting and overwintering on the forest floor. We have pollen and nectar collection from spring ephemerals. We have nesting and overwintering in snags, stumps, deadwood and tip ups. And we even have canopy pollen collection from wind pollinated trees in addition to our beloved and important insect pollinated trees. Um, and that is it. And I usually want to say, you know, to do this work, just like I was highlighting with um, the importance of paying attention to invasive species and restoring all of our different healthy forest layers and long-term regeneration of those mature trees is to know that people have always managed forests. Um, and it, we often assume if people are pushing back against management that it's because of an assumption that forests are healthy, but we know that our forests are facing an enormous number of health challenges, pests, pressures, and climate change, in many cases extremely out of balance deer per, um, ratios relative to historic levels and invasive species or suppression of historic disturbances. And I think we're going to get into the you know, importance of the restoration of things like fire in bringing back a lot of those historical disturbances for regeneration. Um, and then of course, management will be site specific. And lots of management is, and lots of land is for privately owned. Um, super cool to talk to all of you today. And with that, I will take some questions. Sorry to speed through the end there. <laughs> or I or I can just or I can just wrap up um in interest of time. I think I think we have uh we have time for maybe like one one question and I see I see one in the chat which may sure. or may not be a short answer. Um so so we've got a question from from Evelyn who's who's age eight who's wondering what oh, wonderful. is obesity? <laughs> Oh, cool. Hi, Evelyn. Thanks for coming to the talk today um, and for learning about pollinators and forests. Um, so nice to meet you. Um, Bee City is a program that the Xerces Society runs um, 
that helps a group of um, people who are part of any town or city um, look at all the different ways that their town or city can help protect pollinators. And so you'll look at, you know, whether pesticides are used anywhere and whether you can change those to minimize harm to bees, um, whether there's flowers, whether there's nesting resources, whether your um, stormwater management system involves some cool swales where you can plant flowers. There's just so many different ways. So they do a whole evaluation, then you get a certification. So that's what the Bee City program is. And there's a similar one for campuses. So yeah, awesome. thank you so much. Thank you so, so much, uh, Cass. Uh, we, we're, we're, we're coming right up on, on 140. So I'm going to say, um, any other questions that anybody has for Cass, uh, keep them in your head, and, or you can even put them in the chat now, but we're going to address them after um, the presentations. We've got a whole half an hour time slot for questions and answers. So uh, go ahead and stick them in the chat and we'll get to them later. Um, so without further ado, I want to move us into the next presenter, which is our, our North Carolina uh, professional um, who is uh, Gabriella Garrison, who I think I said before, works for the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission, who is out there on the ground doing, doing surveys and learning about and helping us conserve our pollinators here in North Carolina. And she's going to talk about the interaction between pollinators, specifically bees, and our longleaf pine habitats, which are forest or uh, fire dependent. So um, really looking forward to it. Gabriella, the, uh, the stage is yours. All right, thank you, Fallon, and thanks, Cass. That was a really awesome presentation. There's some really good information in there, and actually some great information that's going to lead in really well to some of the things that I'm going to talk about. So like Fallon said, my name is Gabriella. I'm the Eastern Piedmont Habitat Conservation Coordinator for the Wildlife Resources Commission, our state wildlife agency. And while I cover a 23 county area in the Piedmont, I'm stationed, I'm based in the Sandhills, and this is where I've lived for the last 20 years, so I have a special bias for how much I love the Sandhills. So I'm really excited today to talk about some things that I love, including bees in the Sandhills. So today's outline, let me move my window over here, we're going to start with an introduction to the longleaf ecosystem. Um, then we're going to talk just briefly about why is fire important. We're going to touch on some native bee nesting habit, habits and habitats, excuse me. And then we're going to finish and tie it all together and talk about native bee research that's happening in the longleaf ecosystem. All right, so the longleaf pine ecosystem historically was one of the most extensive ecosystems in North America. So this is a map that shows the distribution across a nine state area. And it once covered 90 million acres. And today, this is more what it looks like. So you can see this black outline here of that historic range. And then you can see these green dots, which are sort of the significant strongholds left of longleaf across this historic range. And so you might ask why? Why has longleaf declined so much? Well, that's a great question. There are a lot of reasons for decline. Uh, naval stores in the 1800s and early 1900s when building ships was really popular. Development, including um, agricultural development, if you want to call that conversion to other uses, so conversion to agriculture comes into play here as well, and then fire suppression. So we're going to learn a little bit about why fire is so important to this landscape, and that's one of the reasons why we've seen such a decline in this particular habitat. Okay, so we talked about how it was a really long-reaching habitat covering 90 million acres, currently less than 5% remains, but there are a lot of really great efforts underway to restore this really special habitat. So a lot of people think that the longleaf pine ecosystem, what's really special about this ecosystem is actually the longleaf pine. And in my humble opinion, it's actually the ground cover that is what makes this ecosystem so important and so special. And so when I'm talking about ground cover, I'm talking about the flowers and the grasses, right? And so if you are standing in a healthy longleaf stand, you can have at least 40 plant species in one square meter, which is actually, if you think about it, a really small space. So if you're standing in this area and it has where it's been burned regularly, you're going to see a lot of flowers and different grasses in a really small space. And so we know, based on a lot of research, that 75% of plants in this ecosystem are insect pollinated. So that makes you think that insects are probably pretty important to this ecosystem, right? Well, 
This understory is maintained by periodic fire. So remember I talked about one of the reasons for the decline in this habitat was fire suppression. So now you're starting to put together that this ecosystem needs fire to thrive. And so a lot of people tend to call this the fire forest. So it's sort of a plan words instead of the rainforest, which is an equally very diverse ecosystem in another part of the world. This is the fire forest. If it has the fire that it needs to thrive, it's very diverse and it provides habitat for a lot of different species. So I'm going to ask you a question and I want you to think about it for just a minute. And I know that we've had previous forest tour webinars where we've talked about fire. So you might know this answer already, but why is prescribed fire so important? So think about that. And I'm going to give you the answers here in just a minute or some of the answers, because there are a lot of different reasons why prescribed fire is so important. But some of the top answers are reduces fuel accumulation. And that's a really important aspect from human safety, right? Because everything, especially in the Southeast, has become so developed. So we want to make sure that we don't have something that's going to cause a lot of harm in the vicinity of where we live. So reducing fuel accumulation is really important so that there's a wildfire, it doesn't spread into our, into our homes, into our residential areas. One of the most important aspects from an ecological perspective is that it reduces hardwood competition, woody vegetation, and provides what I like to call clear soil for germination. So in this picture here, you can see that there's a lot of bare ground, right? Now remember that, and this, you should start thinking about this and remember what Cass said in her presentation, bare ground is really important for a lot of ground nesting insects, including ground nesting bees that we're gonna talk about just a little bit later. So when you have that bare ground, you have more vegetation coming up. You have more access for these ground nesting insects. When you get rid of this woody vegetation, you allow more sun to hit the ground. And Cass also mentioned that as well. It's really important for sun to get to the ground. And then lastly, it returns nutrients to the soil. And then a couple other aspects too, minimizes the spread of insect pests and pathogens. And that's really important because that's becoming a larger problem especially in this time. There are a lot of pests, there are a lot of pathogens running through these forests and causing a lot of problems for our native ecosystem. So prescribed fire is really good on cutting that back to an extent. Now, historically, how did these fires hit the landscape? A lot of them were from lightning strikes in the spring and the summertime. That's typically when we had our storms that produced lightning. Another way that these fires hit the ground were indigenous populations, Native Americans that were setting them intentionally for a variety of different reasons, including agriculture, including grazing, hunting, those kinds of things. So now that we've talked a little bit about Longley, we've talked a little bit about why fire is important. Let's talk about the third component of why we're here, pollinators. So we're gonna look specifically at pollinator diversity in North Carolina. And to start, I'm gonna tell you that we have 560-ish, give or take a few, species of native bees. And that's just in North Carolina. So we have a very diverse community of bees in the state. We have over 2,900 species of moths. We don't know the exact number just because it's so diverse. There are still species that we don't know very much about. There are still species that we haven't identified as our own species. So moths are this really interesting insect that we definitely need to learn more about. We have 177 species of butterflies, one bird, our hummingbird, and then an unknown number of other insect pollinators like wasps and beetles and flies, which we'll talk about in just a little bit when we look at some of the research that's been done in some of these communities. Okay, so I'm not going to spend too much time on nesting habits because Cass already covered most of this, but I'll just give a quick review. So we're going to focus on kind of two sets of nesting habits. We're going to look at our ground nesters and we're going to look at our above ground nesters. And our ground nesters, we have about 70% of our native or wild bees that are ground nesters. And some examples of those are mining bees, which we tend to see quite a bit in the spring. Cellophane bees, again, which we tend to see quite a bit in the spring. Sweat bees, which we tend to see all the way through the growing season. But like Cass said, we're not looking at the same species because every bee kind of has their own time when they're above the surface or when they're out from their stem or their cavity or whatever their particular nesting habitat is. And so I really like this diagram here, get my pointer back, because it shows how cool an underground nest is and how each bee is responsible for creating this little chamber where she collects a female bee, she'll excavate, she'll dig this little tunnel, 
She'll provision each little chamber with a pollen ball that you can see here from pollen and nectar from lots of different flowers where she's been foraging. She'll lay an egg on the pollen ball and then she'll close that chamber. And like Cass said, she'll never see that young again. And so it's, it's a lot of work, right? And it's pretty cool to see. And in the spring, oftentimes you'll see these little burrows, right? And sometimes depending on the species, you'll see aggregations of different types of bees. And so it might look like you have social insects, but it's really just a lot of bees in their individual hole that have emerged all around the same time. And we have to think back to that overarching concept of safety and numbers, right? And so these are our ground nesting bees. In a, in a quick summary, and then our remaining species, about 30%, give or take, are either cavity nesting bees, stem nesting bees, or wood nesters like our carpenter bees. And I gave you some examples here, including the carpenter bees, bumblebees, leaf cutting bees, mason bees. Those are some examples of these remaining species. And the nesting concept is very much the same as the ground nesters where the female, she'll create a chamber, she'll provision a pollen ball, she'll lay an egg on the pollen ball, and then she'll seal off that chamber and she won't see that young again. And then Cass went over the life cycle of a bumblebee, which is what you see here on this picture on the far right. So I'm not gonna go into that, other than I just wanted you to be aware of the different kind of nesting habits as we start talking about longleaf pine prescribed fire and the management of that system. Okay. So let's dig in a little more. Let's learn a little more. Arthropods in the longleaf pine system, we know are incredibly numerous and incredibly diverse. And so in this paper here um, that I cited on the left, that is a pretty recent paper, they wanted to do a sort of a summary of all of the different research that was out there in recent years to figure out just how diverse arthropods is, are in the longleaf pine system. And so they did this intensive literature search, and this is what they came up with. And I'm just going to zoom in to this largest number here, 3,032 species of insects documented. And this is just terrestrial insects, too. I should specify that. We're not looking at any aquatic invertebrates, just terrestrial invertebrates. That's what they came up with. And that's a really huge number, right, for one type of ecosystem. But... We have to ask ourselves, is this an underrepresentation? And the answer is yes, because when they were compiling all of this information, they were finding that a lot of the papers were focusing on plant pests and insects that were prey items to other species of wildlife. So it really didn't even capture the full view of the insects that we find in longleaf pine ecosystems. So this next chart is gonna be really interesting because they compiled all the orders, the families, and the species of these insects that they found when they did their literature search. And I want you to take a look at this chart and just kind of hone in on some of the larger species numbers here. And I'm going to help you and highlight that. And I'm going to tell you that all four of those orders have pollinating insects in them. And so Hymenoptera, that order is bees, wasps, and ants, and sawflies. And so bees and wasps, we know, are pretty good pollinators, especially bees are our most efficient pollinators. Coleoptera, those are beetles. We have a lot of pollinating beetles. Diptera are flies. We have a lot of pollinating flies. And then finally down here, Lepidoptera, which are butterflies and moths, which are also good pollinators. So you can see just the strong presence of these different species of pollinators in the longleaf ecosystem. So you might start thinking now, okay, so you've told me that fire is really important for longleaf pine ecosystem, right? You can't have a healthy longleaf pine ecosystem without fire. And now I just told you that pollinators are really important or really prevalent in the longleaf pine ecosystem. So you start the wheels turning and thinking, okay, if you need fire and we have all these insects, then there must be a positive relationship between pollinating insects and fire, right? Okay, so that's just a deduction though. We need to look at a little bit more research and that's what we're going to do. So we looked at where does fire come in when it comes to pollinating insects in the longleaf pine ecosystem. Most of the current research that we have is based either on wildfires or prescribed burns in different habitat types. So habitat types like scrub shrub habitats, grassland habitats, there really haven't been many studies done in the longleaf pine ecosystems that were intentional, that were controlled burns. 
We do know some things about wildfires, but that's a little bit different because they tend to cover a much larger area. They can be really hot. We don't have the specific parameters on wildfires that we'd like when we're trying to do a scientific study to get information from it. So a lot to learn, right? Isn't that always the answer when we're talking about insects? There's still so much to learn. All right, so there have been some studies though that I'm gonna point out that have given us a little bit of insight into this positive what we think relationship. So for instance, these two studies showed that in southeastern forests, some of them longly pine, sites burn every couple of years do support a higher diversity of flowering forbs than unburned sites. That's a good thing because if you want bees, if you want pollinators, you have to have flowers, right? Because that's for how they feed their young. That's how they provision pollen balls for their young. Okay, so let's look at a few more studies because we're going to add pollinators into the mix. We were talking about floral diversity, but now what about studies that actually looked at effect on pollinators? So there was another study, Carbone, in 2019. His team also did this intensive literature search to figure out how does fire affect pollinators. And they found that overall there was a positive effect from wildfires, but prescribed fires showed smaller positive effects. But remember, there aren't that many studies that have been done on prescribed fires. So we're still sort of in murky area. We don't really have a great answer yet, other than just what we can deduce based on what we know about insect diversity in a longleaf pine ecosystem and the positive benefits of burning in a longleaf pine ecosystem. Okay, so then another study, this was actually a graduate study, I think, in Georgia, they were looking at increased abundance and diversity at these longleaf pine plots. And they found that the floral abundance and the bee diversity was greater the first year of the burn compared to the second year, but they said that there still wasn't a lot of statistical significance. So again, we're kind of back in this murky area. So these last two points here, I just wanted to show um, that there were some, oops, let me go back. I accidentally got ahead of myself. Um, if we think about it, if we're just trying to make some deductions, then our potential negative impacts, if we think about it, are what? Direct mortality to insects that cannot escape, right? Um, that one's pretty obvious. What about loss of habitat for these stem and cavity nesters? Because if a fire is rolling through, then it's going to get rid of all of the woody habitat that these insects need. All right, so the positive potential impacts though, there's this new flush of floral diversity. We know these insects need the flowers and it clears the ground. It gives more access for these ground nesting bees because it's ridding the floor, the forest floor of the pine straw and the duff and the things that are building up that are inhibiting those ground nesting bees from nesting. So those are some positive impacts potentially. Okay, so now that I've kind of muddied the water even more, let's talk a little bit about a recent study that was just published that actually looks at this subject in the sandhills in North Carolina. So this study was completed in 2012 and 2013, but it was actually published just a few years ago in 2019. And so this was completed as a master's project with some folks from NC State. And here I wanted to give sort of a geographical reference Here's White County, here's Raleigh. This is where the study occurred on a piece of private property in Moore County right here, the Walthour Moss Foundation. Um, and so what they were looking at is how does bee diversity and abundance compare in a site that was just recently burned this season and a site that hasn't been burned in a year compared to a site that wasn't burned in two years compared to these control sites that hadn't seen fire in over 50 years. And so I'm going to run through this project pretty quickly, but I urge you to check out the paper if you have time and you want to learn more, because there are more components to this project than I'm laying out, but for the sake of time, I'm running through it pretty quickly. Okay, so the Moss Foundation at that time in 2012, they were only conducting dormant season burns. And so dormant season burns typically occur in the fall and the winter. So they were doing it on a three-year cycle. Well, in 2012 and 2013, the folks that were conducting this study, they went out between the months of April and October, and they placed bee bowls or pan traps, which are these right here, the little plastic cups, in areas like I it's mentioned, oops, um, in areas that had either been burned that year, one year prior, two years prior, or like I said, in areas that hadn't seen fire in over 50 years. 
they place these bowls at these sites every two weeks. So once one day every two weeks from morning until early evening. And in these bowls, there was soapy water to catch bees that fell into them and sadly the bees drowned. However, with native bees, for the most part, there are some exceptions, the way to identify them is under a microscope. So we have to have them, um, stud they have to be study specimens. So unfortunately it's a mean trick, but that's the way we learn what species we're looking at. Okay, so the quick summary of this study found that in total over two years, there were 2,276 bees collected. That's a lot. They found that at the recently burned site, the site that had just been burned that year, there were 2.3 times more bees than that unburned site that hadn't seen fire in 50 years. In the same thought, at those same recently burned sites, there was 2.1 times more diversity, more species than that unburned site. So you can see that all of these deductions, all these correlations that we've been drawing, this study has shown that yes, there are more bees in, in a site that's just been recently burned. There are more species in a site that's been recently burned. So another thing that they found that ground nesting species were 2.2 times more abundant at recently burned sites. So that falls in with what we were discussing before. If you clear all of the vegetation off the ground, all of the pine straw, all of the duff, you open up that soil, that bare ground for all these ground nesting species to have access. What was interesting is that there was no observable change in the cavity nesting species. So remember they have their cavities um, above ground for the most part. Bumblebees are kind of wonky in that sometimes they can nest under tufts of grass or they sometimes nest partially underground in old broken burrows. But primarily there were no observable changes in these above ground cavity nesters across treatments. So there wasn't a negative effect, but there wasn't a positive effect on these bees. And so the other thing I should mention too about this study is that they found that bee diversity and bee abundance was the most prevalent at the sites that had just been burned, but floral diversity peaked in the site that hadn't been burned in a year. So you still have a lot of good floral diversity happening for the first couple of years after a burn, but I found it curious that the most floral diversity wasn't at the recently burned site, but it was a site that hadn't been burned in a year. So that was about 10 years ago. And so we took that information and we decided that in an effort to learn more, we wanted to make a little tweaks to the project. And so in 2019, in conjunction with partners at North Carolina State University, and they were the ones that completed that study I just talked about on the Walthour Moss Foundation, we came up with another research project that we've been conducting on our game lands at four game lands across the state. And one of the game lands that we suggested was the Sand Hills Game Lands, which is in my neck of the woods. So I'm primarily going to be talking about that part of the study since we're really focusing on long wave, but I'll give the locations of where some of our other sites were. And so one of the things we wanted to learn was what is our baseline? What kinds of bees do we have on the game lands? Because we just didn't know. The other thing we wanted to look at was we wanted to determine the impact of a growing season prescribed burn on native bees. And the, and the study I just talked about, they were looking at dormant season burns. And so there are a lot of differences between dormant and growing season burns primarily, and I could probably spend a lot of time talking about this, but one of the best reasons to have a growing season burn is that it really controls the woody vegetation. When you have that woody vegetation under control, then you have a lot more floral diversity coming back. Another thing to think about, too, is that this system, this ecological system, longleaf pine habitat, has adapted, has e evolutionarily adapted to fire. So it needs fire to thrive. So it needs fire to have that really rich understory, that really rich ground cover. And so in this study, instead of um, dormant season burns, we were looking specifically at bee response in growing season burns. And so the other thing that we're really hoping to take from this is that we can learn if how we're managing our state-owned lands is actually helping all of these pollinating insects, specifically native bees, because that'll teach us if we need to adjust the way that we're managing in any respect. So like I said, these are, I'm gonna give you the locations of where we did our studies, but I'm gonna really focus on longleaf pine. So we had a study up here in the Piedmont, we had a study down here in Holly Shelter, Noose River Game Lands, 
Here we are in the sand hills, and then up here at Sandy Mush Game Lands. And so these black halos, all of these little dots are representative of significant locations for native bees. But the black halos are really the areas where the most documentation of these native bees had been documented so or had been noticed so that's why we were trying to pick spots that were in these halos where we knew in the past that we had a lot of really interesting species here so we wanted to see if there was anything still relevant to what we'd had a long time ago and so what we did our methodology in a nutshell because i'm trying to stay on track with time every two weeks similar to the past study we went out between april and october we placed bee bowls down at each site we had a recently burned site, a site that hadn't seen fire in a year, and a site that hadn't seen fire in two years. The other difference between this study and the study I just referenced was that in addition to the bowls, we were also netting bees. And so with native bees, there are some species that aren't fooled by our little bee bowls, by our pan traps right here. So there are species that will just see that bowl and they will throw themselves into the bowl. There's something about it that's really attractive. There are other species though that see that bowl and they're like, that's fake. I'm not gonna even go near that. And so by netting, by having a different kind of collection, um, we were hoping to pick up some different species of bees that wouldn't necessarily have fallen into our bee bowls. And so we did a lot of data. We collected a lot of bees. Um, we are right now in the stage of doing a lot of lab processing. Like I said, with native bees, unfortunately, we have to pin them and have them under a microscope to see what they are because the features for identification are usually very, very small. Um, and so in addition to lab processing, we're looking through all the data. We collected a lot of information with each bee that we collected, including the flower that we found it nectaring on. We took a lot of habitat information of where we set down the bowls and where we were collecting um, the bees and the nets. We took a lot of weather information to see if there was perhaps a change in abundance based on the weather, whether the temperature or the the cloud cover, et cetera. So like I said, right now, we're sort of in deep analysis mode. Our last field year was 2022. So we have four years of bees and data that we're working through that we're hope gonna give us some really great information on the response of prescribed fire um, between prescribed fire and bees. And so I will give you, even though I kind of am hesitant to do this because like I said, we're still in the middle of data analysis, but I wanted to give you some preliminary information. This was from our first year collecting in 2019. The blue line was our recently burned site. Um, this was number of bees, bee abundance. And then the other two lines were the sites that hadn't seen fire in one or two years. So you can see that we are definitely seeing an abundance of bees in the site that was recently burned for the most part. So that's pretty consistent with what we were thinking. And then bee diversity, there's actually a pretty distinct difference between the year that saw fire most recently compared to the other two years that hadn't seen fire in a year or two. So again, pretty consistent with what we already thought. And in the last couple minutes, I did wanna just make a few notes of some neat things that we did see that first year. So this one species, um, which is a ground nesting bee, but it's in the family of Megachylidae, which are primarily cavity nesters, like leaf cutting bees and mason bees and resin bees. But this one is a ground nesting bee and it's a rare and declining species and it has very few state records. We found it on Sandhills Game Lands. It was netted during our 2019 field seeding season. And according to a noted bee expert, Sam Drogi, its present is an indication, presence is an indication of a healthy landscape. So we hope that the fact that we found it is an indication that the way that we're burning, the way that we're managing our landscape is productive and is providing good habitat for all of the bees on the landscape. And then this was another interesting observation, this particular species of wool carter bee, Anthidium. We had a lot of these specimens that were netted at all of our sites in 2019. Um, there is a non-native species of Anthidium that has been found throughout the state. Um, so pretty much when you find the native version of this Anthidium, you always find the non-native version with it. They, they forage together. They have the same kind of have us, of course, but on Sandhills Game Lands, we never saw the invasive species. We only saw the native species. So that was kind of interesting to note that there hasn't been infiltration, I guess, yet within that particular game lands of the non-native species. 
And so I'm just going to wrap up with some pictures. I always like wrapping up my presentations with pretty pictures of bees. When I was out in the field, I was really fortunate to have our staff photographer at the time, Missy McGaw, come out and take some really amazing pictures of some of the bees that we saw. Um, most of these pictures are from Sand Hills Game Lands. Some are from other parts of the state, but all of the bees in these pictures can be found on Sand Hills Game Lands and the Longleaf Pine ecosystem. So this is a beautiful green sweat bee. This is another kind of sweat bee. So it shows you that there's a huge amount of diversity between sweat bees. In North Carolina, we have over 100 species, 100 different types of sweat bees. So there's a lot of variation. This is a leaf cutting bee. Um, you can sort of tell from this picture that they carry their pollen, the females carry their pollen on their abdomen. So all their pollen collecting hairs are on their abdomen. So when they're loaded up with pollen, you can see a lot of big yellow fuzz flying around, it looks like, because you can barely see the abdomen through the pollen. This is a queen bumblebee. It's kind of hard to tell um, relative to the flower, but these flowers are pretty decently sized and you can see that she is just really over towering that flower. So they're really large bees, like Cass mentioned, queen bees. This is a carpenter bee. This picture wasn't actually taken on Sandhills Game Lands, but we have no shortage of carpenter bees on Sandhills Game Lands. And I included this picture because people love to hate carpenter bees, but I wanted to show you that she is just covered from head to toe in pollen, or rather from head to thorax in pollen. So they are good pollinators. They do have their place in the ecosystem. They're very valuable from that sense. Um, this is another species of carpenter bee. It's in a different genus, but in the same family. And you can see that she's about the third, a third of the size of the last carpenter bee that we're more familiar with that likes to excavate tunnels and holes in our decks in our house. And then this is a sunflower bee. Um, they're really beautiful. They have a lot of the females have these really beautiful brushes of pollen collecting hair on their hind legs. And then that's all I have. I just love showing off all the pictures of the bees so that people can appreciate how much diversity we have here in North Carolina. Oh, thank you so much, Gabrielle. I love, I love all the pictures of all these different species of bees because when, you know, I, I think most educators who deal with pollinators, when they try to talk about bees, you know, it's like, it's really hard to to illustrate the fact that, you know, it's not just like bees is this one unique, one group, like they all are lumped together. Like the sheer amount of diversity is just mind boggling and so cool when you look at how many shapes and sizes and colors um, and patterns our, our bees come in. So that's that's really cool and and remarkable to see like how how closely tied that, that native, you know, fire system uh, that sort of forest management with fire uh, really is with our, our bee diversity. That's just really cool, awesome work that you're doing and thank you for, for doing it. <laughs> so I think we've got time for a couple of questions. If anybody has any questions for Gabriella, um, I think I see, let's see one, let's see, from Pam Walker in prescribed burns, how does it affect the mid story? For the cardinals and other birds and animals that you rely on? I know that's a common question, like how, how are the wildlife impacted from fire? <laughs> well, so like I said, you know, the longleaf pine ecosystem is a fire adapted system. So fire is supposed to be on the ground because it provides that really wonderful understory that provides seeds for different species of birds, it provides insects for different species of birds. So we get that question a lot. Well, what happens to the birds if a fire rolls through and it burns up their nest? There's a lot of research that shows that those birds typically will renest and it doesn't impact the population. And it actually is good for the birds because like I said, that fire, it provides that really strong flush of flowers that provides either seeds for different birds, depending on what species, or provides insects for those birds to eat. So the research has shown that there's not a negative effect. And in fact, there's usually a positive impact to those species because of fire rolling through. I wonder if it's similar to how, um, you know, if we have like a really, really harsh winter that just, it's just sucky to survive through and it's just uncomfortable for us. But in the, the spring, we might have better temperatures and maybe there won't be as many bugs because of that harsh winter. So that, that short-term inconvenience leads to sort of broader gains and benefits that, you know, we just kind of Got to, got to deal with that short-term inconvenience and in the long run, everything is better because it's, it's yeah, kind yeah. of part of the I, system. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's so true because there's always going to be pros and cons in every situation. 
And the problem is that I think people see the immediate effect, which is the loss of the bird nest, but then they don't see the long-term effect, which is the greater increase in all the forage for those birds. And birds are so adaptable. If something happens to their nest, they're usually gonna re-nest, unless it's really late in the season, but they're always gonna try again. So it's, it's nothing to worry about. They're very adaptable to these kinds of situations. Right. Nature, nature knows what it's doing, right? right. <laughs> we have to trust that nature knows what it's doing. Um, okay, I don't I don't see any other questions. I think there there was a question that um, Cass was able to uh, to respond to in the chat, um, which was talking about uh, let's see, given the importance of forests for bees, I might as well throw it out to you to see if you wanted to to um, talk about that at all, Gabriella, uh, since we just got a minute. Um, so given the importance of forests to bees, especially the value of blooming maples, um, how, how do our speakers feel about forest management policies designed to remove maples to make room for trees more likely to survive climate change? Maybe that's not a one minute question, but if you have any thoughts. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, I think it just, it, it depends on what species of trees they're talking about reforesting with, right? Because, and I think Cass mentioned this too, maples, are one of our best early spring trees that provide forage because in long leaf pine, you know, in, in March, April, there are really no perennials. There's not a whole lot going on in the ground cover. So the trees, that's that's where it's at. And so we really have to focus on the good species that provide those really good benefits. So, you know, we work with a lot of different entities, whether they're local governments, whether they're other government agencies, whether they're landowners, to try to provide them with the recommendations that will get them the most bang for their buck. So, you know, we want to have trees, but we want to make sure that those trees are beneficial for our insects, not even just from a pollen nectar perspective, but from a larval host habitat perspective for butterflies and moths. And so I feel like that's that's sort of where we are right now, the outreach to make sure that anybody who wants to plant trees can really get the most bang for their buck with the tree that they're planting. Yeah, absolutely. And it really depends on your management goals, right? And the site and there's there's so many factors. You can't have, there's no such thing as a perfect habitat for all of the species. You need a little bit of this, a little bit of that. So um, it really does depend, which is kind of the answer always in science. Like, eh, it depends. <laughs> Um, I've got one one short question that I can address, actually. Will a recording of this be available to us? That's from Emily Keel. Um, yes. So after this is over, the this recording will be made available and it will be posted on the Forest Her website. So NC Forest Her uh, or forestherNC.org on the resources page, as well as all of the previous webinars that we've done. So please uh, check for it there. Um, and with that, I want to invite uh, one of our own forest hers onto the stage to talk about um, what what she's been doing on her property in Sampson County. This is Lee Sumner, who has uh, an impressive story to tell. So uh, please, Lee, uh, let's let, let's join you on your journey. Okay. Hi, everyone, um, and thanks for the information uh, Cass and Gabrielle have pro provided. It's uh, very useful to me in my continuing education. Uh, yes, I am a, um, a landowner in Sampson County, um, and I have 125 acres that I purchased over the years that I was in the Marine Corps, and then came back uh, and built on this property uh, and uh, have raised my children here. I, after the Marine Corps, operated a small business, always with the plan and hope of taking over the farm myself. Uh, and I began doing that after COVID. Uh, so in 2021 was the first year. My plan all along had been to convert the farm to fully conservation use. Um, and I am well on the way to doing that. Um, I, um, uh, I would like to say to start with that, um, you know, not knowing the diversity of the attendees in today's class, you can support pollinators as simply as your garden in your in your backyard, your flower beds throughout your 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 yard, um, or on larger scales um, as I am doing it here. My farm, I said, is 125 acres. 15 to 20 acres of that is uh, wetland. 
wetland off of Ward Swamp with two bisecting creeks. Um, roughly 80 acres have been clear cut and eight years ago reconstituted as a certified loblolly tree farm. Um, sorry, Gabrielle, it's not longleaf, it's, it's, um, it's loblolly. Um, the um, uh, roughly 15 acres are hardwood tracks, two of them uh, vintage hardwood tracks, untouched for more than 100 years that are out within the Loblolly forest that were left specifically for wildlife sustainment after the clear cutting and, and reforestation. And then um, four of those tracks are very close in proximity to the main farmhouse and to the pollinator field um, in young uh, uh, hardwoods that have had two, grow two growing seasons. Um, and then lastly, the final 10 and a half acres of cropland acreage have been converted into uh, pollinators. And that is uh, using two different uh, programs, EQIP for the pollinator production and uh, CP33, which is wildlife borders. The wildlife borders share some of the same um, flowers uh, and, uh, that are in the pollinator mix, but they also have native grasses in as well. Um, so that is the makeup of my farmland. Um, and all of this, the third phase of my farm plan is honeybees, not for the production of honey, but I intend to be a small time, meaning 50 to 100 hives, a small time commercial beekeeper. Um, as a disabled veteran, I'm doing that under a European model, specifically the Slovenian model of beekeeping, but that's a topic for uh, a different day. Obviously, though, what I was doing in building this farm into conservation uh, practices was to build an ideal habitat for the honeybee production, and it is certainly proving to be that. Um, so that's the makeup of the farm. Now, uh, Deanna Noble is going to be so kind uh, to help me, and she's going to show you a series of uh, quick pictures that show you starting in 21 and all throughout 22, the prep work done uh, in getting ready to produce pollinators. Um, I'm not seeing those pictures. Are you able to put them up, Deanna? Yep, this is me in my tractor. Uh, that's my barn in the foreground. And it is one it is one portion of the 10 and a half acres and you simply see me cutting uh, the grass. Um, and then if you'd skip, we're gonna skip ahead with the pictures and then I'll tell you the process that more about what happened. So then once they were planted in December of last year, early spring this year, this is what was in this field. If we can get the early spring pick. I'm not seeing early spring. Well, I'll continue talking, and if Deanna is able to show those, you'll see a photograph of what the uh, pollinator field looked like in early spring, what it looked like in late spring, and then what it looks like presently in the summer. Um, behind that field, uh, the smaller uh, level trees are the growing uh, loblolly pine. You'll see the buffer running along the first of two creeks back there. Um, I do want to say that not just the 10 and a half acres of pollinator flowers, but the entire 125 acres is providing is providing food and um, for pollinators of all variety. Um, the um, out in the in the in the wooded areas in the wetland, there are natural, not just oak and maple, which have been spoken to, but there um, obviously all of our pollinator insects, 
uh, require water. They have to have a water source. If you just have a garden and you're supporting pollinators in your yard, in your garden, bird baths are, are vital for giving them a water source near their pollen sources. In this case, there's a swamp and there are two creeks. So there are natural water sources. There are natural uh, blackberry briars in abundance here, poplar trees, sumac, holly. Um, in the spring, I rarely ever saw the honeybees on the actual flowers. That's the early spring picture of the pollinator field. Thank you, Deanna. And, um, but I rarely saw the honeybees there because the honeybees here have so much of an abundance of pollen gathering out of the woods and out of the wetland. Um, now that it is summertime, there's talk about a period of dearth in summer after the nectar flow where the honeybees have to be supplemented food because of, of limited pollen sources. That's not the case on my farm. My honeybees have a variety of pollen sources throughout the three seasons and um, they ha there has been no requirement to supplementally feed. In fact, they're growing so rapidly that one package of bees in March is now three overflowing uh, hive colonies. I have more bees than I can house right now. Uh, they have an abundance of pollen sources. And it's not just my honeybees. Um, in the morning, I can look out across the back field and it is covered and blanketed with a mix of dragonflies and butterflies. I have honeybees, I mean, uh, hummingbirds, uh, and I maintain hummingbird feed stations. There are so many that in August, they are swarming like flies around this house. Um, obviously, too, there are, this was not mentioned much, and I'm not a scientist, but I know that not only do these, the in, pollinating insects do this job, but obviously there is a part played with the animals and their movement uh, through this pollinator area. And clearly I have an, an overabundance of rabbits, all sort of field rodents. Um, there are coyote and foxes in this area. I've seen one wild turkey um, and obviously an abundance of deer. And I do not allow any hunting on my property. Uh, I and my children are bird watchers, and we have birds in abundance as well. Um, so if the other, um, the, now after spring, if the spring, if the late spring picture were able to come up, you would see that it was absolutely gorgeous. You saw nothing but flowers in this field. Um, however, uh, now it's summer. And all of those flowers that were blooming in late spring have seeded. So now across, there are plenty of flowers out there still, but there's also an upper covering of just uh, the seed heads from them. It's still quite lovely. Um, and, uh, but I just say that so that someone that might be looking into this from the, for, from the start, doesn't think that they're going to have nothing but flowers three growing seasons. There will be a mix as spring goes to summer and summer goes to fall. Um, in preparing to do this, as I said, I prepared through starting in 21 through 22. Um, I had allowed the field to stay dormant for two growing seasons, followed with soil testing, purchase of needed equipment, uh, throughout this liaisoning with the Conservation Service and uh, the farm office included some site visits. Um, Deanna, who is participating in, a, in, a, in this today, she has visited a number of times and I'm very grateful for her advice and assistance. Um, then uh, finalizing the farm or business plan, the constant cutting, spraying, cutting, spraying, cutting, spraying, uh, treatment of the soil, uh, then 
applying for state and federal cost share programs. I mentioned the two programs I used the most recently, CP33 and Equip. Then developing the seed mix, choosing a vendor, purchasing the seed mix. After all of that, you then take a breath, you plant it, and you wait to see it grow. And after planting, there's fertilizing as needed and one annual cutback that um, uh, is recommended to occur between March 1 and March 15. Um, that is when it will have the least impact on native wildlife um, and will um, prepare the, uh, for the regrowth in the coming spring. Uh, there are many pros and cons to this. Most of them I see as pro. Um, there's, it produces wildlife habitat, a, a sanctuary for all of the pollinator insects, for all the various uh, animal species I mentioned. Uh, it's positive stewardship of our natural lands. It's ideal for my honeybees. Um, the program enrollment offers some cost share benefits. Um, if you're doing it on the scale that I have done it, it's going to be a lot of upfront cost, but you will recoup in cost share benefits roughly one third of your expenses toward planning the pollinators. Um, you can, uh, once it's all established, you can maintain it on your schedule. So it offers you work flexibility. I travel extensively. I can plan to do the work that needs to be done when I and the weather uh, can accommodate it uh, and just personal enjoyment. The cons I see only as the heavy upfront cost, weed control concerns, and I've decided that what weeds, uh, what invasive weeds are growing among my flowers, uh, as long as they flower, they can stay. Um, and there are very few conservation farmers here locally so it limits my ability for professional networking and discussion. And lastly, I provided the uh, pollinator seed mix listing um, for those who might be interested. And that's all that I have. All right, very cool. Wow, this uh, some some big plans, some big work, and uh, of course, it's it's just a lot of a lot of work to to manage hands on. But it, it's it's neat to see how you've managed to kind of like minimize the the work and get the most impact that you can with the the resources you have. Um, so it's it's two thirty now, and I'm gonna just very quickly do a little bit of official wrap up for the webinar, and then after that, we can open up for our Q and A, and you can ask questions to Lee or Gabriella or Cass. Um, so just, just very quickly, let me share my screen again, and I will um, give you, uh, I want to get, my, get my, my mess together here. Okay, so with, with all that wonderful information, if you're biting at the bit for more ways to connect with Forrest Her, we've got multiple ways that you can connect. So if you're not aware of one and you would like to participate in one of these ways, you can connect to us with our Facebook group, Forrest Her NC. We've got an Instagram, Forrester NC, uh, with a um, pound mark. Um, there's an email if you ever have any questions or comments about Forrest Her um, that you want to email us about. Um, you can at ForresterNC at gmail.com. And of course, um, a great resource is our website, www.foresternc.org, where you can see all of the webinars that have been recorded and posted, um, get to know when our upcoming education events and in-person gathering opportunities are coming up, and learn more about the program and our partners. Um, so not to belabor, you know, you guys don't want to hear me speak, but um, I wanted to thank everybody for joining us today. And um, for the Q&A, you can enter any questions you have in the chat box. And I do want to let you know that you will be receiving a questionnaire or a survey in your email. Please, please take a few moments to fill it out because that's where we get our ideas for um, who our audience is, who are our foresters, and what you are interested in hearing about next. So we want to hear from you. We want your feedback. That is the best way that we can create 
the best learning and gathering opportunities for you. And this is all about partnership and participation. So it's a great way to participate and get your, your word to us. Um, so I am going to stop sharing my screen and uh, let's, let's, let's discuss. Um, let me check the, the chat and see if there were any questions that I might have missed. Um, Bob was wonderful and, and posted the ForesterNC.org um, website address. Um, so if you forward slash resources is the direct link to get to the, the webinars that have been recorded. Um, let me see if I think there was one very early on that was asked that we haven't addressed yet about, um, let's see, it was Ann Davis who asked, uh, I noticed holes in a field in early spring for the last few springs. Who can identify if they are bees? Um, would one of our presenters want to tackle that question? Oh, oh I, go ahead. You can go ahead. <laughs> um, so I was just going to say, if you are seeing them in early spring, they are likely to be some of our spring emerging bees. Like I mentioned, um, some of our common ones are species of mining bees or cellophane bees. And if you sit and watch them for a while, if you see one bee kind of doing ingress and egress, then that is likely to be a solitary bee compared to if you see multiple insects going in and out of the hole at the same time, that tends to be more characteristic of our social wasps like yellow jackets. However, in the spring, I don't really tend to see very much yellow jacket activity. I tend to see that more in the late summer, early fall. So it's a pretty safe bet that if you're seeing, remember I talked about how even though they're solitary bees, they aggregate in a common area. So it'll look like there are a lot of bees that are kind of flying around. And what's happening is that the males emerge earlier than the females do. And so they're hovering around waiting for the females to come up so that they can find a mate and breed and do their bee thing. So it's likely that you are seeing some kind of mining or cellophane bee. Very cool. I didn't know that answer. I'm glad you did, Gabriella. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I'll, I'll interject Fallon and for our audience. So we often get calls in the springtime because people see that and it freaks them out. And sadly, the first response that people want to do is to pour gasoline in the holes or spray water in the holes. And so it's really enlightening because oftentimes the folks that call me are willing to engage in conversation. So I'll explain to them what I just explained here, that we're probably looking at some of our spring emerging bees and they're very valuable pollinators and they're very harmless. They're solitary and they're not inclined to sting you. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And once we've kind of unveiled some of those misconceptions and especially telling them that within a month's time, that's going to be completely gone. You're not even going to be able to see the holes where they emerged from. Once we talk about that, it seems to calm people down and they just need to understand it. But that's the biggest problem. They don't know what they're looking at. And sure, I, I can understand how that can be a little bit worrisome when you have all of these flying insects in a sort of smaller space. So, you know, outreach critical. It's really important to have some good outreach so that people know. You know, uh, just really, really briefly, that reminds me of, a, of an experience that I had here on NC State campus, which is where my office is. It was in the springtime and there was a, the campus was hosting an event on a lawn and there were tons of people gathering around on this lawn. And I being the, you know, nerdy biologist that I am, I looked down and I noticed there were a bunch of holes on the ground and there were bees sort of flying around, hovering around those holes, totally minding their business, not bothering anybody. And I remember like, you know, I looked down, I was like, oh, cool, bees. And somebody next to me like noticed and they were suddenly like they went from having a wonderful time to being really worried and afraid. And, and they're like, oh, no, bees. And, and I had to talk this person down. It's like they're just as much of a threat as they were before I mentioned them, before you notice them, which is not really a threat at all. They're just minding their own business. So take the opportunity to observe and learn about them and have this cool experience. And it just totally took took that experience for somebody to realize like just because they're bees doesn't mean that they're like looking to sting you they they really need animals and they have they have bee business that they're very busy doing <laughs> so, I love that. that's such a great way to say it they're bee business <laughs> let's um let's see we've got a question about where were the wildflower seeds purchased i assume that's for lee yes um uh 
Yes, as you and even if you're doing this as on an independent small scale, you can utilize your local uh, conservation office. Um, they will have a list of vendors uh, that you can select from. Uh, you can solicit um, mixes from those vendors. Each vendor will have a different mix. I went with uh, Garrett Wildflower, which is out of Smithfield area because they are local. Um, they're producing their seed mixes by what works here locally. And uh, Don there, it's Don and Laura Lee who uh, run that operation. He was willing to adjust the mix so that it would be more attractive to honeybees for me. So I certainly recommend them. I did leave the, the cost of those on there. That was my cost at that time. And that's with a veteran's discount. That does not mean that would be the cost you get, but I thought it was helpful for you to be able to see what it might cost per acre for you to purchase these seeds in bulk from Don and Laura at Garrett Wildflower or from some other vendor. Um, Deanna, Deanna just put the, the website, uh, garrettseed.com into the chat for anybody who wants to follow up with that. Uh, may I also say you were asking, you were talking about the response of some people to the ground bees. Uh, others may have had this experience. My yard men, I, as a as a, a a high functioning incomplete paraplegic, I do not do my own yard work. I hire that out. My yard men were very apprehensive about my going into beekeeping. My starter bees are in a small apiary in the backyard because they have been, as they say it, attacked by these bees coming out of holes in the ground. And I know that sweat bees can, in, under some circumstances, be aggressive. Um, so I, I don't know that others will want to do this or be willing to do it, but with as hot and humid as it is, it's very, it's, it's almost feels cruel to me to try to close the bees up, whether they be honeybees or native bees. So I purchased inexpensive beekeepers hats and veils from Amazon that I have here for the use of my yard men. And I've actually seen them while they're protected with their, with their hat and veil actually go by the apiary to watch the bees. So that's a solution. <laughs> that's that's awesome. That's it's really great of you, Lee, to like give them an opportunity to feel protected and also that opportunity for them to sort of engage with the bees um, in a way that they felt safe so that they can learn, you know, they're they're just really neat animals. They're not out to get us. <laughs> I, I've got a, a, a short anecdote about sweat bees. Um, I, I did some some research down in Costa Rica, which is the rainforest, and there's sweat bees everywhere. They come in every color under the sun. They're amazing. I agree with Cass. They're just super, super, super neat bees. Um, but down there, you know, they would flock to you and they land on you to to get the the basically the the salts in your sweat because that's a that's a precious resource down there so they land on you almost like flies and they're like lapping up the the sweat and before like when that first happened to me and i had sweat bees landing on me and i realized that they were bees they were not flies you know like that freak out moment of like oh no because you can't swat them they're not going to sting you unless their lives are in danger. If they're getting swatted and they're getting squished, you know, they might sting in self-defense. So I had to learn how to just like appreciate the experience and like not, not react and just kind of like enjoy it. Having sweat bees, like licking up my little sweat, <laughs> sweat puddles on my, on my arms and, and get to know them that way. So um, anyway, I, that might be a useful story for somebody. <laughs> So, hey, Fallon, I actually have, um, just to circle back to the seed mixes, I wanted to give people a few other options. So Garrett's, um, Don and Laura Lee, they're really great. They're so easy to work with and they have a lot of knowledge. I also wanted to mention that another local distributor that sells um, North Carolina seeds is Mellow Marsh Farm in Siler City. They have a really great website and they have all their mixes and their species available. And the third option is that Roundstone Native Seed Company, which is out of Kentucky. I always forget if it's Kentucky or Tennessee, but it's not in the state. Um, we partnered with them about two and a half years ago, and we gave them starter seeds for 24 different species of North Carolina ecotypes. And the agreement was that they were going to, because we didn't have the real estate to grow them out. They did. They were really interested in providing more seeds that were 
local to North Carolina. So they've spent the last two years growing them out. And the hope is that they're going to have enough next year to provide them commercially to North Carolina customers. So keep your eye on Roundstone. It's a larger commercial company. And so oftentimes they have sort of a wider range of eco types along the eastern coast. But next year, go to Roundstone and check out their availability. And you should see a lot of North Carolina eco types on their list because we're always encouraging that if you're in North Carolina, you should try to plant what is in your landscape, what is naturally occurring in your landscape. Oh, that's so cool. You know, that that's a great illustration of the fact that that this the push, uh, as we understand more the importance of natives, the push for for nurseries and seed suppliers to provide natives, it takes a little bit of time because they have to source those plants from somewhere and they can't just like pull plants out of the ground and sell them to people they have to develop a whole basically a whole business around getting a reliable you know feasible sustainable source of these these seeds and plants and then grow them enough that they have enough to to sell so it's not something that happens overnight but it is happening little by little and it's exciting to see that process happen hey Fallon, i think there's a question in the q a for lee that we haven't covered yet all right. Can you read it out since you you see it? <laughs> I have it here. Uh, the question is from John Howard. Has Lay planted any milkweed with monarch butterflies in mind? And then he goes to state, I've thought about doing that on about a half acre I have here. Um, I can only say that I am told that milkweed is obviously a very much loved plant for bees and other pollinators. Um, I did, they did not come in the mix, but I have a friend in Northern Virginia that grows a beautiful milkweed in her garden. And I brought many of her seeds back, a Ziploc bag full of them. And Don Lee was kind enough to add those into my mix. Oh, that's so wonderful. <laughs> and yeah, I was just excited about that. And the, the, the milkweed is also so important as the required host plant for the monarch butterfly. It's the only plant that it can um, develop on. And, and then I was thinking about the um, seed, the seed situation and milkweed seed is often something that can make mixes really expensive. I also work with the Equip and NRCS programs. Um, and at least up here in the States, I work with there are specific equip cost share um, entries that are designed specifically for monarchs, um, and they have a slightly higher payment rate. As Lee said, it's still only going to cover some, you know, some proportion of what you put into this. So it is a labor of love still, um, but those are slightly higher rates, and they include not just a higher baseline percentage of milkweed, but also a wide diversity of those other nectar plants. Sometimes some of them are similar to what. Um, the plants that, that Lee, you posted on your seed mix there. And because um, the caterpillars need the milkweed, but then the adults will visit a lot of other of those plants um, for nectar. Um, yeah, so it's, it's definitely something to look into and there probably is cost share for it. Excellent. Thank you, Deanna and Bob, for finding that Q&A question because I wasn't looking under the Q&A. Bad, bad me, but go team. We, we figured it out together. <laughs> Thank you, John, for the question. Um, I don't I don't see any other questions that haven't been addressed. I think there Susie asked about what the third company was, but I, I think we we managed to get the third company listed that was Roundstone, got Roundstone, Mellow Marsh, and um, Garrett Seed. So I think that's the three. Um, and then we got a comment from Emily about how she has been stung and had negative like health issues because of stings. So obviously stinging insects, um, you know, can, can be an issue. I think it's important to understand that not all stinging insects are prone to sting. Certainly yellow jackets, they, they're in a category all their own. I'm not going to elaborate on that, but I think everybody here understands. <laughs> hey, Fallon, Fallon, may I, may I uh, just interject? I am allergic to bee stings and I am now a beekeeper. Um, so I do wear the protective equipment, but even wearing it, you can be stung through it if the veil touches your face. Sometimes they can sting through your gloves. Um, if you anticipate, I, um, I usually can avoid the EpiPen, though, by keeping um, liquid Benadryl and a Benadryl cream and, and applying that uh, at double or triple dose, and you 
probably will not have to end up in the ER. But hopefully no one gets stung. I'm just saying that it's, it's not something I feel to be afraid of. It is nature. And, um, uh, and I've, uh, I've only been stung twice. <laughs> Thank you very much for that sort of like on the like boots on the ground perspective on that very, very healthy and like well, well rounded. Um, and every it's up to everybody to, to sort of manage their own personal risk, of course. But Fallon, um, I'll, I'll just add because I've been, um, I've been chasing and harassing, I guess, bees for several years now doing this research project. And I'll have to say I've been stung maybe twice no maybe three times but that's also because i'm putting them in vials and handling them in nets and that's totally understandable um but i will say that at least with solitary bees like you said yellow jackets a completely different story if i see a nest i steer clear of it they definitely have their purpose as a beneficial insect but um they will sting you multiple times and i have a pretty bad allergic reaction however with native bees with wild bees um, when I have been stung, it usually causes a little bit of discomfort for maybe 30 minutes, an hour, depending on the species, but it, it's a lot. I mean, I'm really messing with that bee for it to sting me. It's not their want or their tendency to sting you, especially these solitary bees. So um, if you, I, and I, if they're on flowers, I'm usually up in their business taking pictures. And unless I'm making direct contact with them, they are not bothering me. So, you know, I think you just have to mind your presence in their habitat and be respectful of their boundaries, but they're not going to seek you out. Maybe like a yellow jacket might. <laughs> yellow jackets, so they're in a category all their own. <laughs> <laughs> but still, but still a beneficial part of our ecosystem. Um, I got a comment from Luis Belk talking about getting a savanna mix of native grasses plugs from the Forest Service. And uh, she said a surprise benefit from that was that there are many native wildflowers in with the grass plugs. So, you know, that might not have been what was uh, advertised, but it was like a like a surprise benefit of, of going through the Forest Service for, for plant supplies. Um, let's see. We've got a question from Carrie Council. Let's see, my cardinal plow is, is bustling with hummingbirds lately, but I haven't seen any other pollinators visiting. Does anyone know if there are other pollinators for cardinal flower? That definitely makes sense, the hummingbirds. I also see them on Minarda and other kind of things with long tubes and those redder colors that are more attractive to birds. I I'm pretty sure I've seen bumblebees on cardinal flowers too, but I, I do think that's part of the benefit of the diversity of those different colors and shapes is some will be more attractive to bumblebees, some will be more attractive to sweat bees, some will be more attractive to the longhorned bees like sleeping in your sunflowers in the middle of the summer and um, and then the long tubular red ones usually are more bird pollinated or bird visited. It reminds Maybe somebody me. else has an idea. Yeah. Oh, well, remember, was it I, was it Darwin or somebody else who who kind of found out that there there was a a link between the shape of a flower and the pollinator that pollinated that flower. And um, I can't remember what country it was, but in the tropics somewhere, there's this crazy long flower that's got a foot long tube and they predicted like okay like somebody's got to pollinate this flower there has to be a pollinator out there that we haven't discovered yet that has a foot long tongue to be able to access this and then much later on they actually did discover the species that had the foot long tongue to to pollinate this particular species of flower and so um it's that that tight uh relationship between like the flower morphology or the shape um, and the uh, sort of the the, the physical uh, makeup of the flower and then the pollinator that matches that that leads to those like really tight relationships. Um, so sometimes you get flowers that can only be pollinated by one species. And I guess cardinal flowers might be close to that, but maybe not not a one to one relationship between hummingbirds and and uh, cardinal flowers. Yeah, like you're getting at those relationships are just infinitely complicated. Um, so sometimes those, it's super, super cool. I mean, sometimes it's like it goes even the other way because the bees get so excited and so good at getting the pollen out of a flower that they actually pack it so efficiently onto their legs that they're no longer the one who's effectively moving the pollen from flower to flower because they pack it away so well to bring it home. And so it's actually like in that case, 
a messier pollinator who's like less specialized, who actually does a better job setting seed. And other times it is only the specialist who has the perfectly long tongue or the just the right way of opening a, you know, a, a legume flower that's really tricky to open and only the specialist or maybe a group of specialists can pull it off. It's just totally impressive. So I'm seeing that conversation about the carpenter bees too. I wonder if I wonder if the nest somehow got disturbed. The comment is, you know, we're all used to the really aggressive male bumblebees who are bark is worse than their bite because male carpenter bee, no male bees can sting because stingers are a modified ovipositor. So only female insects have a stinger. Um, so those yellow carpenter bees who are all like rawr, 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 with that little yellow patch on their face, they're all bark, no bite. You can grab them out of the air. They don't have a stinger. But the females are usually pretty distracted by flowers unless the nest is disturbed. So I wonder if there's any chance that somehow that nest was being bothered. Because just like everybody's been saying, they don't come after you unless they feel like they're actually threatened. And, and carpenter bees have some partial sociality where sometimes a couple females will share a single tunnel, even though they're not in big colonies. So I don't know. Hmm. That's a tricky one because they're usually really only when bothered. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Usually, there's there's some some deeper thing that's going on with that situation. But then again, you know, nature does what it wants, and and uh, we can human beings can categorize and like figure out like the the normal behaviors of of a particular species. But that doesn't mean that they have to do what we think that they're going to do. <laughs> um, totally. Yep. We've got we got a comment from Jane, which is awesome, uh, talking about the fact that there are several species of moths and butterflies that lay their eggs on lobelia, i.e., cardinal flower being one one of the lobelia species. So there can be like pollinators that benefit from cardinal flower in that it's a host species for their young, without them being sort of reliant on the the nectar. Um, so thank thank you for bringing in that like multifaceted aspect of the the ecosystem involved. And there's an awesome link from NC Audubon that I'm, I haven't followed, but I'm sure it's got really great information in there. <laughs> All right. Technically, we've got we've got five more minutes. So if anybody has questions or or sort of a contribution to the the conversation or comments, you're welcome to um, take the opportunity while we have it. I I want to give a quick shout out to blueberries. Uh, I have blueberry, I have two large blueberry patches on this farm uh, in two different locations. And I, um, I know that, um, that, you know, Cass is, was talking about the, we're talking about native bees versus, versus honeybees versus my immigrant bees, but all the native bees cover the blueberry bushes in these two patches. Um, I and and there are tons of carpenter bees here on this farm as well. Um, I have fortunately never been stung by one. I do find them quite friendly. Um, and um, literally, I walk through one blueberry patch or field or patch on between the house and the barn, and they do nothing but say hello as I pass by. So if, if you don't have a blueberry patch and you want to see a lot of native bees in spring, plant a few blueberries. Awesome advice. Plus blueberries are delicious. So <laughs> I, I've, I, I've discussed with Deanna though, I don't get a single one of them between the insects and the, <laughs> and the birds and the deer. I don't get a, one single ripe one off those bushes. Me too, Lee. Me too. <laughs> I only have two in my yard, though. But yeah, I don't get, I don't get any blueberries off, of <laughs> and that's okay. <laughs> Can I ask Gabriella a question? Is that okay? Absolutely. I I loved the hearing about the research, um, and I was curious. It looked like. Tell me if I was getting this wrong. Your new data with the diversity and richness across the season in like the three years post burn, it looked like you had the highest diversity and richness in the early month, which I think was June. And then it kind of leveled out to another still high level across the rest of the season. Or do you think that's a spring effect in any way analogous to what I was seeing farther north? Um, are you thinking of expanding to a longer time period or other thoughts on what that phenomenon was? <laughs> 
So, so that is a really good observation. What I didn't mention in the interest of time, so yeah. 2015, this was intended to be a three-year study. So we were following a burn rotation. So we could stay at each site and see it at the at a different stage of burning. And so 2019 was our pilot year. And so we weren't, while we were lining up funding and personnel, we weren't yeah. able to start in April. So we started, that's a really good catch. We started in June. Yeah. Um, so it was still really good data to have, but we were missing a lot of those early spring species, especially in the sand hills where we have a lot of specialists. Um, and so in the 2020 data, 2020, 21, and 22, we had those complete seasons from April to October where we'll be able to see that phenology and really see where the peaks and the valleys are um, compared with the time of year. So that's where we are right now. That's so like exciting. Said, <laughs> deep data processing because it's so, I mean, we, because it wasn't just the sand hills, we had sites in the mountains, in the Piedmont, and in the coastal plain. Um, and so we're trying to kind of piece it all together and come up with some results, but we're hoping, we're hoping that in the spring we'll have a lot of this put together because where we are now is that we have pinned pretty much all the bees up to the last year. So we're pinning that last year bees and starting to do a lot of analyses and making sure we have all the identifications under control. And then we'll That's be able so to- so much work. <laughs> I know, I know it well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a that lot of processing. But yeah, so I mean, looking at 2019, I wanted to have some kind of felt bad talking about this project and not having some kind of preliminary data. Um, and so it did show, I, I guess what I really wanted to show was just that in the recently burned site, we did have higher abundance and diversity, but it really wasn't reflective of a whole growing season because we only had data in 2019, starting from June through October. Cool. Well, I'm super excited. I will stay tuned when, when those come out. <laughs> Are you looking at pollen also? Um, no, we were just, we weren't looking at pollen for that study because we were trying to stay kind of in, we were, <laughs> we were trying really hard not to pull in too many variables so that we were just focusing on, um, on prescribed fire, but you never know. There's definitely room for some more studies in the future. We have a lot of great study areas. Very cool. Thanks. Definitely, definitely a lot of research that has is left to be done. Um, <laughs> so many opportunities. <laughs> so so true. <laughs> We are we are at three o'clock. So officially, I, I think we can call this a, a wrap. I do want to give last final thanks to Cass and Gabriella and, and Lee for taking their time to share what they know about pollinators and, and uh, land management for them. And also for uh, some people that have been in the background a little bit like uh, Bob, who is is like in, in the back, making sure this webinar goes efficiently and Deanna Noble, who is uh, helping with the pictures for uh, Lee's talk and all of the organizers that have helped put these webinars webinars together. So without further ado, thank you everybody for attending. I hope you learned something and join us next time for our, uh, our fall webinar. <laughs> thank you so much. It's been you. a pleasure. <laughs>